Well, hi everyone, my name is Jason Hibbets. Um, thanks for attending and supporting Open Source 101. I'd like to invite you to visit the Red Hat booth after the session and learn more um, about some of our communities. Today, I've got two quick blog posts I'm gonna drop in the chat for you to share. First, we've got one for work, uh, Kubeflow on OpenShift. Hope we encourage you to check that out. And then uh, I've got a fun one for you, the definitive pronunciation guide for, uh, well, I'll, I won't read it to you, but you'll, you'll see how it's spelled here. Drop those in chat. And now I'd like to introduce you to today's speaker, Carl, who's gonna talk to you about deploying your machine learning workflows on Kubernetes with Kubeflow. Carl, take it away. Hey everyone, uh, happy to be here uh, from home here in uh, Austin. Um, so I was going to be there in person, you know, it would be a local event, but uh, here we are. Um, so uh, I'm with Google's developer advocacy team. I focus on data science and data engineering. I've been doing a lot of uh, DevOps and uh, ML work, sort of that intersection that they now call ML ops for several years now. Um, so I'm going to start with our presentation. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and get started with that uh, in just a moment. Uh, here we go. And um, hope everybody can see my screen. Um, OK, so uh, let's go through the agenda here. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the challenges of running a machine learning project. And we'll talk about how Kubeflow helps with that. and we'll get into a demo, which is always the fun part. So that's just kind of a very quick version of the agenda today. Uh, so let's just set the stage with why are we even here? So uh, especially in machine learning, uh, there's been a lot of emphasis on prototyping and research, getting a, a model out the door. Hey, it looks great. It's got 99% accuracy. Let's put it in production. Well, we all know that from working in the software world for many years that uh, you know, we write our unit tests, we set up CI, CD. There's just a lot of guardrails that we need to set up to make sure we're successful. After we've got a, an initial promise of a working application. Uh, so let's talk about some of the challenges. The first is continuous monitoring. And that's this idea that uh, you know, over time, your model accuracy may drop and we'll talk about a few reasons for that and you'll need some process in place for continuously monitoring to see how is that model doing so you don't end up with fire drills as it starts to degrade over time and so you have a process in place for that another issue is called training serving skew so when you build a machine learning model you're learning from a lot of examples you're looking at raw data and trying to figure out what the rules are from that raw data now, if there's a difference between the data you trained on and the data that people predict on after it's in production, you're also going to start seeing some issues. And this is a very common thing that can happen uh, accidentally if maybe there's a bug in your code, the code that you use to transform your data uh, in the training set is actually different from the code uh, for prediction. Maybe there's some, you know, extra feature or some difference in how you transform the data that can happen, or just you start to see that the model, uh, the, the real world use, usage of your model, different data is, is being sent to that model. So that's something you wanna look for. Finally, another challenge I wanna throw out there is this idea of models having different freshness requirements. So um, let's look at some examples of this. So if it's say, you may be looking at news, clearly that, that's changing so quickly that a model may get stale quicker than something like on the other extreme, a voice recognition model uh, that's going to say, stay stable for some time. And, and everywhere in between, maybe an e-commerce or product catalog <clears throat> starts to change. And if you're doing recommendations or the movies change or, or what have you, then uh, you'll just need to think about a strategy for retraining your models with new data uh, so that you're not just looking at data that's no longer relevant to the data from today. Uh, so when you look at data science, a lot of times we think about building the model as everything there is. This is the center of data science, right? But there's a lot more, uh, and especially if we've worked in 
other disciplines of software engineering, data engineering, uh, to get to the point where you can even build a model, there's understanding your data sources, transforming the data, validating it, you know, making sure that it's all, uh, you have the, the right amount of data, the right types of data. Uh, you'll need to train your model. You'll need to look at the outputs of your model. Uh, and we'll look at that a little bit in the demo later today. We'll need to put into production, serve that, put a REST API around it, maybe monitor it, log it. So a whole bunch of other things that you can't just take for granted. And that's uh, we're going to see how the Kubeflow can help it. Um, so another angle here and the difficulty of setting up a machine learning environment is not just the process, but the layers of the stack. There are a lot of them. There's the model, tooling, drivers, uh, et cetera. You know, there's specialized chipsets uh, that may require a different, uh, different code to run on, different parameters. And so it's just critical to get all of these pieces of the stack working well together to be able to run those processes in a consistent way. So say you have that set up in your dev environment, there's the issue of having consistent environments, making sure that everybody's using this, you know, simple, a simple issue is just using the same version of TensorFlow or different Python packages. But uh, there's a whole bunch of other things you want to make sure that are consistent across these different stacks for each of your environments. So here comes Kubeflow. So let's look at what the uh, mission statement is for Kubeflow. And I, I like this mission statement. It's stayed constant for the last three years of the project, been the North Star for the project. And I think it does a good job of explaining all the things it does. So first, making it easy for everyone. So the project tries to provide defaults, out of the box configurations and installations so that you don't have to be a Kubernetes expert, but you can customize it quite a bit as needed. And that's the beauty of open source that it's open. You can override things. You can take the Docker files that come with it and uh, extend those. Uh, the next part of the mission statement is uh, what you can do with it, develop, deploy, and manage. So the whole life cycle of machine learning. And finally, it's portable and distributed. So you can easily take your workloads and port them across on-prem cloud, different types of environments. Um, a nice thing too is if you're using Kubernetes for your traditional software development, you can use it for machine learning as well, and you don't have two different stacks to worry about. And, you know, your DevOps folks don't have to manage two different environments, so learning curves around those. And then finally, there's the distributed nature of Kubernetes, which is perfect for machine learning, where you need to scale your workload across uh, cl your whole cluster uh, as you're doing training at, at massive scale. Uh, so let's look at the core capabilities of Kubeflow starting in clockwise fashion from the top. So you have your development environment, that's Jupyter Notebooks. I'll show you what that looks like later. That's sort of the IDE for your data scientists. You've got operators, which are essentially Kubernetes APIs for specific uh, framework options like TensorFlow, PyTorch, XGBoost, et cetera. You've got the ability to build workflows and pipelines, and, and the pipelines in particular, an area that I want to focus on in this presentation and show in the demo. There's data management, and this is key in that the to have reproducible results, you need to not just know what your model parameters are, but you need to know where the data came from and have that lineage be able to track the, the data coming into your model. You also need some tools around debugging your models, uh, something called hyperparameter tuning, where uh, you're trying to find, say, the optimal number of layers in a neural network or units, and you can do a search across a broad space of possibilities to optimize what those parameters will be to get the best result. Again, another great use case for Kubernetes to distribute that hyperparameter tuning across your cluster. Uh, there's metadata, so tracking information about each model run, you know, who built it, when did it run, what was its uh, success or not, uh, custom metadata that you might want to add on it to categorize, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, serving, uh, which often is overlooked. There's a lot of 
uh, work to build the model. And then uh, if it's a successful model, hopefully you're getting a lot of API hits against it. So the KF serving or Kubeflow serving uh, approach that we'll discuss in a little more detail later gives you an API around your model and helps serve it in a very scalable way in your Kubernetes cluster. So in a nutshell, that's what Kubeflow provides. And let's look at some of the characteristics of Kubeflow. We mentioned portability, scalability, uh, composability. So that's what we'll focus on the pipeline section. You have one tool that can bring together multiple disparate parts of your machine learning lifecycle. And finally, it supports specialized hardware. So it will allow you to unlock uh, chipsets that allow you to run uh, neural networks much quicker. Um, so that, that's always great. From a design perspective, uh, what has guided Kubeflow? Uh, number one, making a Kubernetes native. So using the constructs uh, that might be you know, things like uh, CRDs or using the, a command line that uh, there's a special CLI called KF CTL, just like cube CTL that allows you to run different commands. Um, and it's uh, framework agnostic. Uh, so that's, uh, that's always a good thing. Here is a rough view of the components of Kubeflow. So you have ingress, you know, coming into your uh, Kubernetes cluster, you uh, basically traffic gets routed to the appropriate uh, API. Uh, the, on the left side, there is a central dashboard that provides a UI to launch a lot of the different tools. There are operators, which are basically custom APIs to run different machine learning jobs. And finally, there is the serving capability to serve your model. So how would you install Kubeflow? Uh, you there. Not only is there a UI uh, on certain cloud providers, there's there's some additional capability. But the the universal way to install it uh, is using the uh, KF cuddle command here, uh, and you just uh, apply the configuration files. And you can see there's this is just a handful of the many uh, YAML files available in the. Uh, GitHub repo for Kubeflow that sh you know basically describes the cluster uh, details and all the different services that are installed. And running this will uh, install the all the Kubeflow services that you need right there. And more information is in the docs uh, for installation. So just another view on what it does. We'll kind of again work clockwise here through the different things starting with development, how do you train a model, uh, orchestration and serving. So from a development perspective, this is what it looks like uh, in the, at the top when you view your notebook servers. So this gives you a set of container images that have a pre-installed configuration of TensorFlow or whatever other frameworks you wanna use. You can customize these images or use the ones out of the box and you specify the size of the notebook server you wanna use, you connect to it, and then you see at the bottom, it launches that instance, and that allows you to create a notebook file, which is essentially a scratch pad for your research that allows you to run different cells of Python code and build your model. So that's the uh, development piece of Kubeflow. Let's look at how you'd run training. This is just a simple example to get the concept across um, of you know how it works under the covers here. So on the left side, we have a YAML file which defines one of the jobs. And there's a lot of these YAML files available in the uh, Kubeflow repo. So you see here, for example, with PyTorch, uh, if you wanna run a PyTorch job, it might provide specifications around the resources that that job needs the container image, which contains the training code for that image. And that's what this YAML or descriptor file uh, provides. To launch the training job, you might then run a standard uh, Kubernetes command to launch the job. And then also if say you want to monitor the job, uh, you know, we wish these jobs would run immediately, but you know, they can often take some time and you can view the logs and you can see 
the, it, doing all the passes through the data and seeing the status of it with your standard Kubernetes commands. So Kuber, KF Serving uh, provides you an interface once you've created your model to host the model in the cluster. And there are two different operations you see here to predict and to explain. Uh, it, we'll, we'll just mostly focus on predict as explain gives you extra information to tell you what were the important features of your model. You know, your model may be a function of 50 different pieces of data. Some are more relevant than others. Ex explaining the model can provide some insight into what moved the needle the most in your model. Uh, so as far as prediction is concerned, this is where you uh, pass in some given variables and you want to get an answer back. You know, was this a cat or a dog? Or, you know, I always have to use that in ML presentations. Uh, what, whatever it is that you're defining in your model, that's what predict will provide. And it allows for your standard deployments in this notion of a canary deployment where you might uh, take an experimental model that you're not quite totally sure about it, but you can direct a little bit of traffic to it, see how it performs, and then, you know, roll more and more of that traffic over to that new endpoint. Uh, and so this component, again, has explain and predict uh, capabilities. It also has a transformer because sometimes the raw inputs that you get, I'll make this up, you pass in a date object, but your model expects a month and a day. The transformer might break that up into the different components. Uh, for instance, there's a lot of cases for how you might need to tweak the data to put it into the format the model needs. That's what the transformer can do. All right, so that's an overview of serving. Uh, and pipelines is the area that I wanna focus on the most today. And pipelines give you that end-to-end -end ML workflow. And this is what really gives you machine learning, CI, CD type of capability. And we'll walk through how to actually build your own pipeline. So you can define your pipeline in Python. And the idea here is that data scientists can build this pipeline and under the hood, the, uh, the various Docker containers and infrastructure is built for them. Uh, the, the data engineers, the DevOps folks, the ML engineers can definitely go in and work at that level and work with the containers and the Python files if they want, uh, but the data scientists can do this programmatically with a, uh, with, with a simplified language so that they don't have to worry about that infrastructure. So let's just walk through a, a simple example here that you can see it's from the Kubeflow examples repo. I'm just saying a couple of code snippets um, so you're not seeing the full picture, but let's walk through the concept. So the first part is defining the pipeline. You see that there is a DSL or domain specific language where you say, hey, here's my pipeline. I'm gonna start defining it and I might provide some metadata for it, the name and description and some other things. Then you might define uh, the method for that pipeline that has some default values. You know, how many training steps, where's the data gonna come from? And these things can be overwritten, but it's often nice to provide a standard pass. You don't have to populate it with all the different values. Okay, so that's the pipeline itself. Now, what about the components within that pipeline? So this is what that code would look like here. First, you might import, so here you're seeing the uh, Kubeflow Pipelines SDK. You're importing uh, the components a package. And then what you might do is import the component from a URL. So here you see that there is a YAML descriptor of that component here on the web that we're going to uh, import that component from. The next part might be instantiating that component. So that component is gonna have different arguments. Here in a, in a simplified example, we have two things. It's a copy component. It has a source directory and a target directory. So you pass those in and you've got your component. Next, let's talk about how do you wire these different components together? So let's say that we have a log component and we define it however we define it. You have commands such as before and after, et cetera, that allow you to specify the flow of what comes after the next in that pipeline. And the neat thing here too is that you don't always have to explicitly do that. Say if log data required as an input copy data, 
it would be smart enough to figure out and infer that what the right flow is that the log data always is after copy data. But if that's if you're not including outputs and inputs within other components, you'll need to manually do something like this. So now you're building a pipeline. Okay, so how do we deploy that pipeline? So we would uh, use the Kubeflow Pipelines compiler package. We would compile it. It would end up as a tar uh, gzipped file. And then you see in the uh, dashboard below, uh, you can upload that pipeline uh, from a URL, use it in the dashboard. And this is the, it, we're in the demo, we'll actually walk through this in more detail. And now you've got a pipeline. All right, so we talked about uh, writing your own custom component. And I know that looks a little challenging at first, and often you don't even need to do that. There are a whole set of library of components for common machine learning tasks that you can wire together without writing your own. So if you look at some of these examples, querying data, transforming, Spark jobs, so on and so forth, uh, they're all available in the GitHub repo under pipelines components. And one area I want to dive into a little bit more is TensorFlow Extended or TFX, where there's a library of various components that have been honed and tested by Google and released as part of this TensorFlow Extended library that we can take advantage of here. So let's look at what some of these components are because we're going to use them in the demo. And we're not gonna go into a lot of depth here, but just show an example of a workflow using them. So you see here, if I, this workflow uh, takes various examples or piece of raw data. It generates statistics on them so you understand the data better. Then we're, basically I'll skip some other things. We transform the data, we train it, we evaluate it, and then we push it into production. That's what these various standard components do. And we'll show how that they can be run in Kubeflow pipelines. So from a architecture perspective, one thing I wanted to point out here is that um, if you look at the top, what we've talked about so far is the Kubeflow pipelines SDK as the way to define a pipeline. And you see sort of in the middle, this custom pipelines, with custom and pre-built components we talked about. Now, as we're bringing the uh, Kubeflow uh, pipelines and TFX projects uh, in closer harmony together, you're seeing uh, a, a TFX SDK, which allows you to define it in the that uh, other SDK that focuses more on TensorFlow uh, specific uh, terminology and things like that. So they all work together nicely. Uh, for our demo, we're going to look more at the KFP SDK, but just to show that these all uh, work together well. All right, so let's look at a custom component and you know how you'd actually build that. Uh, it, there's a lot here, uh, but I want to just get across some of the main concepts. So say you were going to build your own component you would start with a descriptor. This is the YAML file. And what are the key things you see here? You might see a name, a description of your component, maybe some labels that are used around that component, and then some arguments. You see here on the inputs on the left side, what are the types and what are the names of those arguments for your component? On the right side, the key thing here is the implementation section, or rather, let's start with the outputs, right? What the component outputs, of course. In the implementation section, you see a link to the image. Now, this is the uh, Docker uh, container image here on, it happens to be in the Google container registry and the various arguments for that. So this really uh, is what, if you want to import a component, you point to this file and that's the first step in this process. I'm gonna show you three different pieces of code to build that component. So the next is the Docker file. So you start with the base image and then we can add some additional packages to it. And the key thing you see at the bottom here is the entry point into that image. This is the code that's going to do the work within that uh, Docker file. So what might the code look like within the Docker file uh, or rather within the container? 
Uh, you might see on the left side here, like your definition of the, uh, uh, you know, the main uh, method here, you see parsing the different arguments coming in from the component. You know, what directory is the model in? Where's the data, et cetera. And then on the right side, you can see the action happening where we're taking some of that information and we're actually doing the things, uh, running training or logging, et cetera. And so this is how it kind of all gets uh, brought together, a component definition, the Docker file, and within that uh, Docker uh, image, the uh, model itself. Okay, so now that you've built a pipeline, let's what would it look like in the user interface? So you'll, you're actually able to see experiment run results. I look at this as like your the equivalent of your uh, build system for traditional software development where you see um, the the run, what time it started, did it pass or fail, links to logs, and then accuracy, right? So maybe instead of thinking about, oh, how many unit tests passed or something like that, uh, how successful was this, how accurate was this model? And uh, and we'll talk about how you could even do things like maybe have tests that uh, prevent your model from being pushed to production unless uh, only only if it hits above a certain accuracy level. It allows you to track artifacts, and I know that this is a little bit blurry, but this uh, screenshot just shows that uh, as you're doing things with your pipelines, you can then track and store artifacts so your team can share them. Uh, so in summary, we've talked about Kubeflow, which is a cloud-native cloud multi-cloud solution for ML. It provides a platform for composable pipelines, and if you have Kubernetes, you can run Kubeflow. And just to talk a little bit about our community, it's an open community. Uh, love to get more folks uh, participating, involved. Uh, and uh, here are a few ways that you can uh, connect with the Kubeflow community. So with that, now I want to uh, switch to a demo. Um, and so what I'm going to show now is the uh, the pipelines dashboard. So this happens to be on Google Cloud Platform. Again, this can run anywhere. You have a Kubernetes cluster. Um, what I'm showing you here is the standalone, the sort of lightweight version of with Kubeflow pipelines alone, right? So there's a pre, uh, we, I've got a installation already created here. So we don't have to go through all of the creation of the cluster, but it does have a nice way that if you want to use the uh, user interface to create a pipeline, you can simply configure it and specify the cluster uh, or create, you know, and it will create it for you or you can select an existing cluster and so on and so forth. But I've already done that piece. Okay, so let's open up the pipelines dashboard and take a look at what we see here. So let's look at the pipelines that we have. I am going to uh, look at one of the out-of-the-box demos that's included with Kubeflow pipelines. And this shows you a very robust end-to-end -end model with all the different components wired together. So this is a taxi tip prediction model. Uh, what this is doing is it's looking at some uh, data from the city of Chicago. They've, uh, you know, a lot of government data is uh, publicly available. And it looks at all these different taxi uh, trips. And what we're trying to do is predict, just it's a binary mo classification model, is do we predict that the tip is going to be greater than 20% or not? Okay, so that's all that this model is going to do. Uh, and when you install Kubeflow you know, pipelines, you're going to see this. You can click there to see the source code. So if you're interested in offline looking more at this model, uh, here's where you can uh, you know, do that. Um, you see, you see the pipe, the uh, notebook, and and all that right there. So let's keep moving. Um, so let's uh, look at this pipeline. So this is the pipeline. Think of it sort of. This is the class, not the instance. This is the, um, you know, the the structure of the pipeline. But it's not an actual run. If I want to run the pipeline, I click Create Run. And here's where I might specify different parameters to say, run it on data set X or Y, or as we showed before, maybe 
how much how many passes through the data different ml parameters you might want to pass here or not uh, so that's how you start to run uh, doesn't hurt i could actually kick one off now uh, so but let's look at one that i've already done here so i'll click on this run and now you see the green check boxes so yay uh, every step worked successfully that's always good for a demo uh, and I know there's a lot here, but I'll try to just kind of briefly talk through the key points that I think shows a real world production ML workflow and why this is pretty cool. So first one is looking at, it's called example gen. And all that's doing is looking at your data and doing the train and test split. It's parsing the CSV, it's holding out some data to test on. Uh, here you see on every, uh, every step, you know, within that container, looking at the logs within it. Uh, so if you needed for some reason to troubleshoot something, it's all there. Um, the next thing we're going to look at is statistics gen. So now that we've uh, pulled in this data, let's look at what's in the data set. And that's what statistics gen can do for you. Again, these are the TFX components that you can pull into your workflow and you don't have to write this these components yourself. So let's look at statistics, Jen. I'm gonna just expand this window a little bit. So here you see, it provides you a nice view of what's in your data. So remember, this is a taxi tip prediction model. And you can see things like for each, you know, that we've got about 5,000-ish, uh, I guess I think it's 5,091 rows in our data set. We always have a fare, which, you know, that's key. The mean fare is about $12. Uh, it tells you the standard deviation, median, max, all that kind of good stuff. And then here's some of the other data. This is what we use to predict, you know, the, the very you know, latitude, longitude, you know, so on and so forth. And then we have some tip data, start time, you know, the company, the payment type, all kinds of stuff like that. Okay. So, so this is a great way to understand your data after it's been imported. Okay. Uh, the next thing it does is called schema gen. So this is where it can look at your data and try to infer the types uh, automatically. So it's looking at this different data and saying, okay, there's a company, which is a string uh, and you know all these different things, you know, is it required or optional based on how often it showed up in the data set? Then you might see for what's called categorical values, where you have, think of it as a drop down, where it's a within a set of values. What are those values that it's seeing in the data set? So it's seeing all these different companies and then payment types, it sees about six different uh, payment types, makes sense, cash, credit card, et cetera. Okay, the next step it's gonna do is an example validator. So it's gonna pass, the test data through that scheme and just make sure, did that line up with the schema that we have? And generally it did, but here it's pointing out some of the anomalies. And some of these make sense, like the companies, we didn't capture all of those in our training data. So that looks like they're in the, the holdout records, there were a few other companies. So probably we don't wanna harden this into our schema and say that these are the only available companies as that seems to, to change quite a bit. And it looks like for payment type, we may have missed something called PR card. Uh, so anyway, it's gonna flag for you uh, if there's any anomalies in and differences between the schema that you've generated uh, and, and additional data flowing through the system. All right, so, so now we've looked at the data, we understand it, let's, we might go through a trans, uh, transform step that you see here. I'll kind of keep moving on and then now let's look at sort of this is where things really come into production. So there's a trainer step where you can train uh, your model and you're going to see things like uh, TensorBoard, which shows you a visualization of the loss of the model. You want to see the, the error, you know, being more and more minimized over time. Uh, and, you know, you're going to see logs during the training. This is where the actual a lot of the TensorFlow code is being run, where it's uh, you know, you see the loss for the model, your uh, stuff like that is all in the training step. All right, and now what we might do is here's the evaluator step. And I think this is a neat one because what this can do, it's using something called TensorFlow model analysis. And what that's doing for you 
it, it's allowing you to look at the accuracy by different slices, right? So it's one thing to say, hey, my model is 80% accurate, right? But you might want to, you know, peel back that onion a little bit and understand that accuracy through different slices. And that's what this can do is it can say, well, let's see how accurate the model is, you know, when the trips start at 1 a.m. versus say 9 a.m. or whatever. So you see all these different slices here. Um, and we could we could pick any uh, number of slices, but this is a good way to see like, is the experience for all of your users, are we getting a similar uh, experience? And if not, how can we improve that, right? So you can see, uh, you know, accuracy broken down by these different slices, which is very cool to see. Uh, so now let's talk about the, uh, the continuous deployment aspect. So what we can do here in the model validator is where you can define rules where you can say, um, if this model is better than my previous one, we can create what's called a blessed model. So you can see that here. And if, if the model is blessed, then what happens is in the final stage the pusher will then push that to production, push whatever the blessed model is uh, there. And then you know, again, you'll see the logs um, and you see you know where the model got pushed to and you're good to go. And you know there are uh, extensions for say different cloud platforms where you could uh, host it in, in the cloud or there's all kinds of different uh, configurations. Uh, the, the as far as the pusher. So this is an end-to-end -end example of a real-world ML workflow. As you can see, there's a lot involved in it. And it's great to see this all uh, being tracked. Um, so let's. So now we've seen uh, that run of an experiment. Let's look now at the artifacts. So we talked about every run can track different things. So if we go to the um, the you know different. Uh, artifacts generated by this pipeline, you can see, you can link directly to some of those statistics and things like that. Let's dive into the model now. So if I click on the model, so I can see some of those custom properties we talked about. You can add more if you'd like, but I, what I think is pretty cool is this lineage explorer, where this is where you can see for your model, what were the different other uh, steps and how did they, how were they combined together to get to the next step of the model? And you can click on any of these individual artifacts and kind of see see that relationship between them here in the uh, Lineage Explorer. Uh, and then finally, you know, with executions, you can see, um, you know, just more detail on, on each of these different models uh, and their artifacts. So that's uh, Kubeflow pipelines in a nutshell. Um, and I'm gonna go back to the presentation and that's pretty much it. I, um, I'll stop sharing now uh, and I'll see if there's any questions in the chat window um, before we wrap up. And I like that, yeah. So I am not sure how to pronounce kubectl uh, or kubectl. Maybe we need a poll about that. Uh, so, all right, I'll just wait around for another minute, see if there's any questions. I appreciate everybody attending. Hopefully you got out a lot out of this. Uh, running uh, you know, machine learning in production is difficult. It's great we have tools like Kubeflow to help. Um, so I'll just see if there's any other questions. Right. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Um, and uh, all right. Uh, I think we're ready to wrap up.